I don't want to cheat, or maybe I can't. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Mike Garcia. Um, I'm also running for school board for District 4. Um, I have a small diversity behind me. I, I, I do. Uh, I'm a law enforcement officer for the last 27 years, and five of those I spent in the school system here in Lake County. I also have three children. Uh, I have a 24-year-old, a 21-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And my son's back here. You heard him talk earlier. I also have two more students that are part of Team Mike. I have a lot of students that have wanted to get involved in the system, get involved in this politics, and I'm teaching them along the way so that maybe we'll have future uh, politicians out of the kids that we have out of our county. Uh, another thing that I, I bring, and I say the diversity part of it, is that we've never seen that. I have educators currently right now, like Sandy and Betsy and Pat, who are actually on there. I bring a different perspective to this. I'm an investigator. Perspective. We come in as law enforcement officers and investigate a situation or a problem and we find a solution for it. That's one of our big things that we do. We try to make sure we take steps and uh, inches to get ahead and gain miles in these type of things. Um, one of my platforms is to also help our teachers. Our teachers currently uh, need some kind of budget increase. A lot of our teachers currently right now are um, falling behind with our salaries, and I see a lot of you shaking heads because I see a lot of educators out there. You guys understand that. And hopefully this next four years, we'll be able to find something to be able to help at least a cost of living increase. The last part of my thing is location. Thank you, guys. Hello, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Betsy Farmer. <laughs> so I'm Betsy Farner and I'm also running for Lake County School Board District 4. What I bring to the table is my experience teaching. I've taught for 37 years. I've taught elementary, middle school, high school. I just finished off teaching 15 years at the various high school and retired on June 2nd. I have the perspective as a teacher. I am a parent of three children who graduated from Lake County Schools, so I know how parents feel about our school system. And I would like to go to the next level and also be part of the decision making. Um, as I said, my kids graduated from Lake County Schools. They all graduated from DeVere's High School. My husband and his four siblings did as well. I've taught 33 years in Lake County. And uh, 20 of the years that I've been teaching have been in science. I have a master's degree in curriculum and, of course, a bachelor's in education. And I have proven my leadership skills. I was on the Lake Salmon Water Conservation District for 12 years. I was a chairperson for the last four years and treasurer for most of the years. Um, the board was the supervisors on board. Our goal was to conserve water as well as conserve soil. And we did deal with some budgeting and cost share programs. And it was a very rewarding time in my life. Now I would like to serve our community, Lake County, and help our schools become top-notch schools. Thank you. I just want to say that uh, Molly Cunningham is on her way and will be here in about five minutes. So when she gets here, uh, we'll let her take a breath and then let her do her introduction to it and then we'll start the questioning. So thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you for having me this afternoon. I am Pat Nave running for District 2. My opponent is not here today. Um, I've been an educator for over 37 years. 20 of those years I've spent as an administrator in Lake County Schools. Um, it has been a pleasure to serve, and when I was called and asked by some people to run again, I did some research and decided, yes, the school system is not where I had left it. I served as assistant superintendent for three and a half years and moved the district from a C to an A. It has not had an A since then. Our surrounding districts have A's, and this is what I expect for my grandchildren who are now in the system and every other child. So after watching and talking and praying about it, I decided I needed to come out of retirement and, and go back to work for Lake County Schools to serve the community. So I proudly am doing that now, and my race will be decided in the primary on the 18th, so please make sure you go out and vote. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think we're just going to go ahead and start with our questions and then we'll get Molly up here as soon as she gets here so we don't hold you all up too much. So we'll start with you, Sandy. Um, what is your position on resource officers in our schools? Everybody will answer that question, please. How much time we have on this? <laughs> all right. Uh, resource officers, as well as we have a guardian program, as well in the school system, uh, and they are very much needed in our school system. Uh, there to protect our students and our staff on the campuses. Uh, the Guardian program mainly is there to take and patrol the campus to make sure that there's no threats that come on our campus. And our resource officers that we work with the police departments and the sheriff's department to provide officers for us. They take and are there in case we need to make an arrest. Our Guardian program cannot make an arrest, but our officers can make the arrest if necessary, and they're also there to protect us. I am very much in need of more of this on our campus, and I just want to say, because of a 0.75 millage, this is why we have every class of our schools, not every class in the school, but every school in our district has a police officer, a deputy sheriff, or and a guardian, but one or the other on the police or the deputy sheriff at every school in Lake County. Also. We have them there at the charter schools because part of that 0.75 million that you approved, a portion of that went to make sure that they had the officers as well. So we have to share our, our monies that we get from the state and from you as well. And it's done appropriately that way. But uh, I would not want to have a campus that did not have our officers. Thank you. All right, so I need like five minutes to explain this a little bit more to you guys. Um, as a former school resource officer for five years in Lake County, also a supervisor, I'm going to let you know we do need SROs in our school, uh, without a doubt. The great part about having an SRO in our schools uh, over the last couple of years was I got to participate personally with each one of the students on campus. But I didn't participate only with them, but with their parents also, the school staff, and also the community around the schools. That helped me to get a really good perspective as a school resource officer for what really is happening on the ground at our schools and in our communities. Uh, our guardian program is a great assistance to any SRO that's on a campus. It means I have a backup partner almost, okay, in a really tough situation. Um, remember the reason for our schools to be safe with the guardian program is to make sure that we have no other person come on our campus to hurt us. As a school resource officer, I feel like I was one of the sheepdogs at the protection gate of that school. And there was nothing in our county, and I can I speak for all our school resource officers in the county, nothing coming through that gate that day that's going to hurt our kids, our staff, or anyone in our school. Because we would give our life just for that. So school resource officers have that good point. The next thing I want to let you know is that we're also a great family resource. We do counseling. I sat for hours in my room speaking with kids about suicide, about how they were feeling, how family issues were. Did they have enough to eat that day? I even bought a bed for a kid because that was her Christmas gift. That was the wish she had. I currently have kids right now with me, part of my team staff. So they stayed with us for a long time as school resource officers. Thank you. I interrupt this program to introduce Molly Cunningham, also running for school board. Um, and Molly, I'm going to give you 90 seconds to do, do your elevator speech, and then we'll fit you in with the first question, and then we'll go on and we'll just keep going around, okay? Good morning. I guess it's afternoon now. I apologize for my tardiness. Um, the life of a person campaigning is really busy. I had no idea. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet all of you. My name is Molly Cunningham, and I am currently running for District 4, Lake County School Board. I am a retired educator. I've been retired about two and a half years now. I was a teacher, a dean, uh, an assistant principal, and a principal. Most recently, when I retired, I was principal at Carver Middle School 
uh, in Leesburg, Florida. I am very proud of my affiliation with Lake County School Board. I was recruited to Lake County while still an undergraduate in college, and the reason for that was because my undergraduate degree is in audiology and speech pathology, and there was a shortage of speech therapists at the time, as Mrs. Nay well knows. Uh, that's something she and I share. Um, my reason for running is probably the same reason you're here today to hear us speak. It's because I genuinely care about what happens in Lake County Schools. I care about the children. I have two adult children um, who are Lake County graduates. Um, they did very well with their Lake County public school education. They are now both college graduates and doing well, one of which is a teacher in another district. But the Lake County school system is the heart of our existence. I'm sure you know that society's greatest thing that they need to accomplish is to educate our youth, and I'd like to help be a part of that. Thank you. I am an old time principal, so of course when I first became principal, we did not have resource officers. And I didn't quite understand what a vital role they would come to play in our schools. Um, however, I will remind you that once upon a time, our Lake County schools had some difficulty, and we actually had a shooting in one of our middle schools here in Lake County. When that occurred, I was actually an assistant principal at another middle school in another town, but I can tell you that shook all of us who work in the school, school system, that shook us to our core. Because for the first time, we realized that we did need law enforcement and that we couldn't always properly protect and make sure that every student that was present in our schools was safe. In the last 12 years, I have worked on campuses where I've always had at least one resource officer. In some cases, I had two. Um, and I found them to be full of resource. I found them to be someone that I could work with, the students could go to, and it turned out to be a great partnership. So I have no issues with having resource officers on our campuses. I believe they play a vital role. Thank you. What is your position on resource officers in the schools? All right, well, after being a teacher, 37 years, and I started teaching in 81, that there were no officers on campuses. And I started teaching elementary. And I believe the first time we finally had an officer, it was after the Tavares Middle School shooting. I was teaching at Tavares Elementary, um, and I can recall Allie Waters at the middle school was a really good um, school resource deputy. I know after Stoneman Douglas and being in the classroom that day and afterwards, um, and going through the active shooting program or shooter program, it is very important. I, I, I will take a bullet for any of my students, I always said, and a lot of teachers would, but it is a very scary time. Now the good thing about the Guardian program is it saves Lake County Schools money. I was talking on the phone with Mark Palmer, who heads the program, and he said that um, it cost for a SRO or SRD about $110,000 a year. And the um, Guardian program pays $15 an hour, plus the Guardians get full benefits. So it's a win-win situation to have an extra backup on campus. I totally support it. Thank you. As with the other candidates, I totally support the program. It's a blessing we have it, and we appreciate your tax dollars helping to fund that. It is imperative we have it. As we move through these troubled times, I'm worried for children who have been watching things on TV for six months, coming back into our schools, not having the quality of respect for our law enforcement that they need to have. Um, I want to reach out with both the sheriff and the city municipalities to invite the law enforcement. Come have lunch at our schools. Come let the children see them in a non-threatening atmosphere. Build those community relationships. And our SROs and our Guardian program is critical to maintain that safety. Can bad things happen? Yes. Are they going to be there like any of us would be as an administrator to, to stand in that line or a teacher? Yes. 
but that lets the community and everyone else know we're watching out for our children. Okay, Molly, you get to answer the next question first, and then the next question will start with Mike and go on around, okay? All right, so uh, the question is, um, citizenship can be a part of anybody's cap platform or campaign, and I would like to understand what that means to you. When I retired two and a half years ago, my husband and I went on a very educational vacation. We went to Cuba, and I can tell you, I highly recommend, um, if you should have that opportunity, but one of the first things I learned upon arriving there was that I am very happy, very blessed, and very fortunate to hold citizenship in the United States of America. Amen. There is nothing like going to another country to make you appreciate what you have at home. As you can probably imagine, I was very interested in the schools there. And upon arrival, I found out that at noontime, they just open the doors and all the children come out and they go wherever. If you don't have a parent who shows up to have lunch with you, you're just kind of free on your own to figure out what you're doing for lunch. The first thing that happened to me was a little boy accosted me because he wanted some pesos. Um, and I don't know how much you know about Cuban culture and I don't want to really get into that. But I didn't have any, because Americans walking on the street, that's not the currency that you're allowed to use. But I can tell you that citizenship is perhaps one of our most, or should be, and it is mine, one of our most treasured things. Because as a citizen of this country, regardless of how we got here, it is the best ship going. And it is something that we have people who have died for. Uh, my husband is a prior military person. And it is extremely important to me that all children in school understand what citizenship means. In my last school, I had a partnership that allowed the students to have training in citizenship. Citizenship to me, it means a lot. I've taken my children uh, on many trips around the world. We traveled many different countries. The reason why we did that as a family was we wanted to make sure they realized what a great country we live in today. I'm an, exactly an example of what you could do when you start young and start focusing on your life and making yourself a better citizen in our country, a productive citizen in our country. Uh, I started in the South Bronx to a poor family as a single mom. And trust me, my neighborhood was nothing like where I live now. And I was able to work myself up through school and through my police department to be where I'm at in front of you today. My father was in jail, and through campus ministries, I'm sorry, through jail ministries, we were able to meet the Lord and be able to be here for you right now. And that's why I bring my children and my students towards that step all the time. The second part of this is I do feel like also citizenship teaches our children the pride in their country, the history of our country, the reasons why they walk into a booth every year to vote for that person they feel is going to be the best representation of their community. I like you guys to do that today when you're thinking about it. This election time period is really important. The other thing is to teach our citizenship to our students, respect, love, and admiration for their communities, giving them a better place to live. So all that combined to me means a lot when you tell me about citizenship. Again, I'm proud to be American. I'm proud to walk the streets as a United States citizen. And all over the world, I've made sure people knew and never hit that I was a citizen of the United States. With citizenship also comes responsibility to be a good citizen. Citizenship is, I believe, important to everybody here. It is, we are just so fortunate to be in the United States of America and to have the national defense that we have to keep us free and to be able to continue to be loyal citizens. In school, I try my best to teach the students to become good citizens um, and to let them know that with your citizenship, you also have a responsibility to be a good citizen and to be upholding and to be honest 
And as Michael said, teach them respect and to respect each other's. Um, I could go so many different ways with citizenship, but it's very important to me. My father was retired Air Force, and a lot of my uncles were in the different world wars and Korea, the Korean War, and I just know that they're fighting to keep us free and to keep our citizenship, you know, alive. Thank you. We always need to improve on what we're teaching our children about citizenship. When children come into Lake County schools and they register, we are not allowed to ask them if they're a U.S. citizen. That's against the law. But what we can do is provide them flyers, and I plan on providing flyers to them to show them how the process works and how they can become a U.S. citizen. Fifteen years ago, we had over 50 different languages being spoke in Lake County schools. We are a community from a world community, and we need to teach those children coming into our system what sedition is, the responsibilities for it, and how to become one. There's no office in Lake County where you can go to sign up to be a U.S. citizen. You have to go to Orange County to do that. But I want to make sure that as they're coming into our schools, that they're given the information provided in several languages so that they know the process and how to do that because it's important for them to understand the land they're living in now. Thank you. citizenship is about. And years ago, whenever I was a young boy, we used to have a paper here called the Tiberi Citizen. And I used to sell those for five cents a piece, and I would get two and a half cents, so I had to sell two to get five cents, uh, so that I could be able to make some money doing that. But to me, citizenship is where you live at, what you make of it, and how you live before others so they can see what you are doing as a citizen. Whether you're a that is living up to the law of the land, or are you going out there and creating and being corruptive? But I am a citizen of the United States. I was born here in May 5th. I'm sorry, in May, the fifth month. But May 21st in 1958, I was born here in Lake County. I am a citizen of Lake County. I stand for Lake County. I stand for what the Constitution says we have to do. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. And I am a pastor, so in my local congregation, Every year, every part of the year that we have a holiday that has to do with Labor Day, Fourth of July, things of that nature, we acknowledge the United States. I have a lady that likes to sing the song, Born in the United States, you know? I'm a citizen. I'm here. That's Sandy Gamble. Thank you. Um, our next question, we'll start with you, Mike. How do you feel about the 1619 project? Uh -huh. I pretty know who gave me that question. We've been uh, addressed that several times here um, in our candidate race. And uh, one of the things that I have to tell you, I'm not going to sway from what I've said from the beginning till right now. For me, 1619 is not one of our classrooms. Uh, we already have a curriculum that we follow. It's been proven, it's been tested. Um, we will follow that to the end. Do I feel as a periodical that it shouldn't be in our school libraries? No, I do. Look, 27 years I've protected people's constitutional rights and freedom of choice and belief. And so if you want to believe in that or you want to follow that, I'm not going to sway you guys to change your mind, but I'm going to tell you that I'll allow someone else to read that. That's not going to be me who's going to sway somebody from doing that. But it, does it belong in our classrooms? Absolutely not. That's a pretty easy answer for you to give, and that's the best I can do right now. I absolutely do not support the 1619 Amen. program. It is
it's not our true American heritage. It's not our true history of the country. Um, if I just always think about when Levin interviewed Bob Woodson, Robert Woodson, and if you would hear, if you look it up on YouTube, he articulated what the 1619 program was, written by New York Times. I mean, come on. So, uh, and then he started his own program, and I support Robert Woodson's program, the 1776 program. Yes, and I mean, you can't change our history. Our history is our history. I mean, our country didn't start until after the American Revolution, really. And we need to teach these kids the Constitution of the United States. I used to have my kids memorize the preamble. And they need to know about the American Revolution. I absolutely do not support 1619 program. Time's up. Uh, but the 1619 project does not belong in the Lake County school system. 
and I don't see it ever getting there. I question our curriculum department. I question our assistant superintendent over that, and she said we do not have it, and we don't plan on ever having it as long as they're here. So that's my statement. Well, I too have done some research, uh, a lot in the last week, and I can share with you that I would seriously doubt that it would ever reach a Lake County school classroom for a variety of reasons. The good thing I can tell you that if by chance it did, there is a process to have it removed. And as a citizen, you have a right to take part in that process. Every school principal and librarian, or media specialist as we call them now, are required to have a challenge committee. And that includes people from the community, community stakeholders. And anytime there is something in the library that you don't feel is appropriate, you have a right to challenge that. And it goes through a process whereby it could still be removed. I think that the best weapon against anything that you don't appreciate or that is not in your way of thinking is to always know what your alternatives are. Always know if that should happen, what can I do about it? It's extremely important not to just have an opinion. And by the way, my opinion is it does not belong in Lake County Schools. I concur with all of the other people on the stage. But I would take it a step further. I would say, in part, if we are going to be prepared to make sure that we protect what is in our schools and what our students are taught, then we need to avail ourselves of all the possibilities and all the ways that we have to deal with that. So while I assure you that I don't think it would ever be anything in Lake County that you would have to deal with, should it come, there is a process. Next question is, in your own words, what is the mission of the school board? The school board's mission definitely is to set curriculum and to choose wisely everything that we've been saying about bringing history back. Um, our governor has a great new plan called BEST. It's an acronym for benchmarks for excellent student teaching and I think that once it becomes it comes to the board it needs to be considered it's got to be taking away the inner course exams the common core and it's bringing back teaching students how to um, write cursive again so they can vote and you know, it's like I said it's getting rid of common core it should be also I'm, I'm pretty sure with our governor we're going to have the American heritage and U.S. history taught the way it's supposed to be taught. But the school board is just so important for that. And I'm going to do my best, all my power that I have, and my know-how and research to, you know, set the curriculum to the best, make us A schools. And that's the school board's functioning. Very important. The curriculum is a key piece. This year they are merging both the Common Core and the BEST, um, and then we'll have it in place for next year. So they're pulling in, they will have to come before the board to have it voted on. Curriculum is my thing, so I'll be watching that very intensely. And the research I've started, they're going back to teaching math the way we learned it. They are going back in literature to go back to more of the classics. So you are going to see a shift in how the education is delivered in Lake County Schools. I'm here to make sure that they have the appropriate budgeting for materials needed as some of the skills that are learned are now moved to different grade levels. So we need to watch that closely. Um, the school board is also entrusted to set any policy that comes forth for us and entrusted to um, make an evaluation on the superintendent, whether she's doing her job or not, and then to set the budget. I am very familiar with budgets. As assistant superintendent, I had eight departments under me and ran my own $10 million budget, so I know how to read budgets and see how they flow and make sure that they're doing things correctly and use that money wisely because we're getting a lot less tax, re tax revenue this year with the shutdown of COVID. So budget is a very big concern for me. So I will be looking at those very closely to see that we can use our, our tax dollars appropriately. 
in your own words, what is the mission of the school board? Our main mission as the Lake County School Board is to educate every student that comes through the doors of our schools to make sure that every student has the opportunity and they set the goals that they would like to achieve to be able to either go to college or learn a career trade while they're in high school. We have set up many different trade opportunities for those that don't want to go to college or don't plan on going to college. Just about. And then we also have the career path for those that want to go to college. We have guidance counselors lined up, lined up at the high schools to help them to make those choices and guide them that way. Our main mission is to make sure that everyone is treated equally through the school system. Our main mission that we have is that we want to become a destination district. Now we've caught a lot of criticism about that because of different things. But the problem is a lot of times what becomes that is what makes that is funding. And it's like any home that has problems at home and you find out what the problem is, a lot of times it's because of lack of funding. So it causes friction at the home. But the same thing that happens with the school system. But our main mission is to make sure that we do the policies and procedures. We're responsible for that. Hiring of a superintendent that I think we did a very great job doing. And let her lead Lake County to take it to a destination district without us sitting there trying to nitpick everything that she does. We're not involved with the day-to-day -day operation. We're involved with the meetings and the days that we have to meet the meetings, the workshops, all of those things to make sure that we put together a budget that meets our needs. There's a lot of things that comes down from Tallahassee. The problem is when they sit it down, they don't send enough funding. That causes problems. So you will see that in the near future. Thank you. Based on Florida statute, the responsibility of the school board, first and foremost, is to set and make sure that policy is followed. I think uh, taking that a step further, the thing that you have to know about the school board when they set policy is they have an obligation to their constituents that they are supposed to develop and pass policies that represent the views of those who elected them. I think that that is extremely important. I think when you become a public servant, of course you have your personal opinions, and we would hope that they would be in line with your constituents. But you must always remember the people who voted for you. It was those things that they felt that you were standing for that they voted for. So it's extremely important that every elected official, to include school board members, remember when making policy or doing whatever it is their job is to do, whether it's raising taxes or cutting taxes, you have an obligation to those who elected you. As a school board member, it is important that you prepare yourself and that you somehow are able to talk to those constituents that you represent. You need to know their feelings. You need to know their thoughts. You need to have discussions. Um, of course, now that Lake County no longer has an elected superintendent, it does come within the purview of the school board to elect the superintendent. It does come before the purview of the school board to approve the budget. The budget is developed by the finance department at the school system, but it has to come before the board in order for them to approve it. Those are the things that you have a right to hold your school board members accountable for. Thank you. So I believe the mission is going to be when we get there is to make sure that we constantly remember that Fiscal responsibility is important, just like at home. We need to look at our budget and make sure that we're fiscally sound, make sure the money's going exactly where it needs to be going, uh, make sure that we're constantly uh, working with our school superintendent to make sure she knows that we support her also. There's a lot of places we can help her when it comes to going and get funding for our state. Uh, working with different district representatives up there in Tallahassee would also be another thing I would like to do to make sure that they know that this school board is involved and that when money starts coming down from Tallahassee, that it needs to come back to our school system. The other part of it is policy and procedures and, of course, curriculum. And I know this because I've watched it for five years in the school and how it works, and I'm glad that we've had good conservative leaders in the past who want to follow the same steps. And the last thing I want to make sure is that we know is that as a representative of our community, I've been out there. I've been in your streets. I've been in your neighborhoods. 
and I know your parents. I've watched parents cry in my eyes and, and cry in my office. I've watched administrators cry in my office. Okay? I know exactly what we need in the school systems because we've been out there in the streets. And so I want to make sure I bring that back to the table again when I'm out there looking for the ways that we can help to improve our school system. Thank you, guys. We're going to go to you first on this question. Um, if students are wanting or requesting to participate in, participate in a nationwide um, protest, how do you feel about allowing students to leave school to participate in a protest? And that would, that's, in, that's for anything, Black Lives Matter or any, any other national protest. Just I believe we as citizens always have the right to protest. Riot, no. Protest, yes. Um, I had a mother who checked me out of school, and that's the proper procedure, to go to a political rally when I was in middle school. That is acceptable. It was an educational experience so I could learn how government was working. So I think it is up to the parent to decide if they're allowed to have that absence from school, you have to weigh that against what's happening, you know, if they're having exams or not that day. But we all have a constitutional right to protest. That's a hard one. Because constitutional rights versus what's right or wrong. Uh, Personally, I, I have a problem with it, but the thing is, what we are governed by, if a parent or guardian comes and wants to check their child out, they have that right and privilege to do that. Uh, what happens as far as the rest of the day is up to them. But I don't believe that, that we need to be emphasizing to our students that they need to go out and do protests that are violent. Uh, recently, we had a, a, a march here in Tiberias, and it was back to blue. It was not so much a protest, it was something that, but it was a, a movement to try to let the police officers in Lake County and all over know that we supported them. I don't have a problem with that, but I think it should be organized to where it is not interfering with the student in their educational day, so that it does not interfere in that form. But, as I said, if a parent or guardian comes up and says, I want to check Susie or Johnny out, um, you're supposed to, as a, an administrator, allow them to be checked out. So uh, we can't say that they can or can't go to that. Uh, it's just not a good thing that we need to be trying to influence and, and trying to tell them, hey, you need to go protest this. No, that's not it. And being a pastor, uh, I'm to follow peace with all men. So, you know, for me to sit there and promote someone to go out and protest in a violent form, I cannot do that. Sorry. Well, school board policy says that a student can be checked out by their parents. Um, and as far as whether or not the administrator intervenes, that kind of settles it. Um, on a personal level, of course, I do not condone any kind of riots or any kind of uh, protests or rallies that are going to cause a problem. But it's just like anything else. If a parent comes in and says, I'm checking my child out, actually, um, you know, maybe we, we might say, do you have a doctor's appointment or is it for a medical reason? But they don't really have to give us a reason because legally they are that child's guardian. And if they want to check them out to take them wherever, they certainly can. Um, of course, we would follow policy again when they came back to school the following day or later in that day with the note, and that note would determine whether the excuse, whether it was an excused absence or an unexcused absence. I think the thing that we need to do most is make sure that the culture in our school district and on our school campuses is one of peace, is one that believes in abiding by the law, has respect for everyone, certainly our police officers, and I think if we can create a culture on our school campuses and in our communities that do that, then we should be okay. Thank you. So remembering that question after I gone through five different people, she asked, do we, as a school board, have the right to tell a parent or someone that they cannot take their child off to protest? And that's how I felt the question was asked. And that answer is no. 
I think each parent has the individual right to do what they would like to do with their child. I believe that and I respect that. Uh, protest is a good thing. Under these conditions that we have currently like now, we're thinking about that and saying that might not be that good. But you know what? Let's think about something more positive. Okay? Uh, my children have been involved in different protests throughout the years. In fact, my family's been involved in protests, including myself in Europe, on certain occasions on human rights. So I believe that protest is a good thing. And if a parent wants to choose to let their child exercise their right to protest peacefully, I'm all for it. As a law enforcement officer, I've protected people who actually held signs right next to me at a Nazi rally that said, brown people need to leave our country and should be dead. And I've supported that person's right to do that because I feel that in America, we have the right to do that, especially here in the United States. Thank you, guys. Well, in the United States of America, we are so privileged to be able to choose, choose our schools, choose whether we want our child to miss school and go to a peaceful protest. And I agree with Pat, there's, and you all know there's a big difference between a riot and a peaceful protest. Um, then that gets me going a little bit further into our attendance policy. It used to be we could decide whether or not that would be an excused absence or an unexcused absence. And right now our attendance policy is suffering and a lot of kids are being checked out for no reason. And we have a lot of truancy. But as far as the, the choice, yes, um, you know, if they want to check their child out to protest, there's nothing we can do, as you know, we've all said. But again, I think we need to look at what the protest was about. Was it educational? I think we need to work on our excused and unexcused absences more in our school system the way it used to be because we just have so many kids checking out for no reason, at least at, at Tavares High School. And we need to get back to, you have three excused absences, and then after that you need a doctor's note. Because we want these kids to graduate, and we don't want them to be truant and be dropouts, and that's what's happening right now because of our attendance policy. So parents need to be very careful whenever they check their kids out. All right, thank you. See, we are starting with uh, Sandy. Okay. How important are sports to students, and how important do you think it is to have sports return to Lake County schools? Well, I coached youth sports here for 15 years in Tavares. Uh, I moved up to the high school, coached baseball, softball, and basketball. I'm presently an assistant coach at Umatilla High School softball with my daughter. So uh, I believe sports is very much needed in our areas. The only concern I have, or the main concern I have, is safety. And right now with everything that's going on, until there's proven fact that it's safe for our kids to be able to be that close, to be able to participate, I think that's the key factor of whether we have it or not. Uh, the Florida High School Activities Association is meeting this coming Friday to discuss further what will happen with fall sports. As you know, college says they're not going to have them. Some say they want to have them, but some are saying they're not. But we are governed, as far as athletic participation, through the Florida High School Activities Association, what we can or cannot have. So I believe sports has its place because I know some students that the only reason they're in school is because of their athleticism. And because of their athleticism, then they are offered a scholarship to go to college in some cases. But it keeps them in school. And the thing is, if they're involved in youth sports or in high school sports, if they're involved in that, they're not involved in something else. Thank you. Sports plays an important role throughout society, not just schools. Um, Sunday afternoon football is a popular pastime in most households here in America. I certainly uh, respect the right of any student who has athletic abilities to be able to participate in sports. And certainly, when it is deemed to be safe and appropriate, I certainly support them being able to play sports 100%. Uh, 
But I do believe at this point in time, unfortunately in our country, safety has to come first in all things, to include sports. And while we may miss the high school games, because you know it's not just the athletes. We also have our cheerleaders, we have our band members, we have all those people that have practiced and gotten ready for all these halftime shows and they're losing out as well. So it is a very important part of the school system and I certainly hope that very soon we will be able to reinstate it such that all those people uh, who are participating will be able to participate and those of us who like to go and watch will be able to do that as well. I think it's super important. I've watched all my kids out there at the high school level and at the middle school level who are super competitive. They're dying right now. They can't wait to get out in the field and go out there. But as a parent, that side of me comes out and says, safety first. Um, I'm part of an organization which I started with an Officer Smith from the Outdoor Police Department. And we currently have a model of it going on at Outdoor Middle School. It's called Omega Lambda Gamma. Um, those two students you see back there are part of my A students for this team. They all have a 3.5 or higher GPA, most average about 3.8 GPA. They're all student athletes, usually the top in their athletic development section. And they are dying to get back out there so they can get ready because the program gears them towards going to college and receiving scholarships. Um, and that's what we're pushing for. So when we start the school year, it would be very curious to find out what happens out there to these kids. But I still feel that safety is first. I don't want none of my kids um, being sick or having something that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives, especially out there trying to get to school. My band members are my sweet, sweet kids that are out there constantly supporting it, and my cheerleaders. Uh, you'll see a bunch of them that are going to be supporting me on this weekend. They're all excited about being out and going to start back to school, too. So thank you, guys. Sports are really important in the schools, but I think safety at this point is going to be the one that I take a step back for. I think sports are extremely important for our school children. As a teacher, watching it, so many students just would fall through the wayside if they didn't have some kind of extracurricular activity. And sports keeps a lot of those football players I know, I mean, when the coaches say, at once a week we had to fill out a form giving their grade point average in each subject. And if it wasn't good, if it was below a C, they weren't allowed to play, they were on the bench. Those kids were more motivated to turn in their work. And it's the same thing, any kind of extracurricular activity that holds these kids accountable for their grades and them showing up to school, it's going to help our graduation rate and lessen our dropout rate. They're very important. And as far as safety, talking to a few of my doctors and bending their ears and asking them how they feel, they feel that the school children really are not the problem with their health unless they have a weakened immune system, they have asthma or high sugar or maybe obesity. But other than that, the big safety factor is maybe they are exposed and they bring it home to an, an older person in the house who's, you know, as they say, 65 and older, you know, you shouldn't go anywhere. But that, here we are. You know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, my one doctor just told me the other day that that's the biggest safety issue. But as far as the kids getting back there, they should be okay. And I trust him. I support sports in the school system. It not only encourages them, supports them, gets them to school, makes them accountable for their grades, but it has a hidden curriculum of teaching teamwork, belonging to something. It goes far beyond just that sport. Um, it builds their peer relationships. It covers so much. So sports are critical, not just sports, but clubs as well. Um, band, all of the different clubs, journalism, anything. It gives them a goal, something to work for, something to belong to, and that is needed for children, especially those that have been stuck at home now for six months. So they need to, that outlet because you remember when you were a teenager, you needed outlets. These, they do too as well. So I do feel that right now, FA, the Florida High School Athletic Association will make that determination. I'm hoping they will consider shortened seasons that maybe football won't start till January. It would overlap with basketball. 
but it's a Friday night thing, and they don't practice on the same places. So if we're short in basketball, short in football, possibly we can have that. So those children that do receive those scholarships. So I'm sure the Florida High School Athletic Association is thinking of this problem is they make it as a statewide policy, and we know that what's happening in South Florida is not what's happening here. So I'm hoping they're going to take that into consideration. We don't travel all the way to South Florida to play a football game. But we do go inter-county around Central Florida to play those games. So I want to, I'm hoping they'll look at that and come back with some reasonable decisions that will help our children have those experiences. Thank you. How do you feel about passing students who do not meet the grade level in reading and math proficiencies? We'll start with Mike. I am a firm believer that standards are set for a reason, and children need to reach those standards. Um, as a principal of three schools that were struggling, and having had to put in curriculums that enabled them to stop struggling and earn A's and make AYP, I can tell you that that's no easy task. However, it can be done. I can tell you it can be done because I did it for a number of years. I believe that you start out with the goal in mind when educating a child. You have to know what they need to know at the end of the year. And then you have to put in a curriculum and a process in place that will enable them to be able to meet the standards. So I believe in a win-win situation. It is always or has always been my philosophy and my goal and I've always tried to create a culture on campuses where I was the leader, that we're struggling to make sure that every student reaches the goal. Um, they have something called retention and placement meetings at the end of the school year. And teachers basically come in and sit with the principal and make recommendations on those children that haven't quite reached the goal. My question always was, why didn't they meet the goal? What can we go back and do now differently to make sure that they do? So I believe it is essential that students master the skills that are required. But I also believe that it's important and we owe students, we owe them a process that will create a plan so that they can be successful. Uh, growing up, I was taught there's never a free lunch. All right, so I don't believe our students should be getting a free lunch. I told you we're, we started a program called the Omega Lambda Gamma in the high school, and my kids in that program exceed the standards that we set for them at a 3.5 GPA because they really want to do it. And so I believe as a dad, my three children all have different learning abilities, and I need to make sure that each one of them got taught the way they were able to understand it. My daughter is a genius. She's a 4.4 GPA. Never needs help. She, in fact, she corrects all the stuff you saw in my campaign ad. She's corrected all the English and the grammar on it. And my middle guy, he's the kind of guy that goes ahead and can put an alternator in a car and come back and say, Dad, what else you got next? And my current one, um, my eldest that graduated from UCF, he's actually my campaign treasurer because he has a finance degree from UCF. I tell you that story not to brag on them, but to let you know I understand the differences in teaching our children at different levels. And I'm not, a, I'm not going to go ahead and say that we should give even anybody a free lunch and we should make the standards equal across the board to make sure they meet those standards. But like Molly said, I want to know why that child did not reach that standard at the end of the semester and what we can do to improve that person. I firmly believe in starting early in the elementary schools to get reading programs established because once children learn to read properly, everything else comes easily. And we need to push that in our schools to make sure that is an essential and a part of learning. That helped me as an inner city kid growing up to know that I could actually go to a library, enjoy being there, and learn to read, and push me through to where I am today. Thank you. We are 15 minutes past time, and Ada, do you want to let these ladies answer okay. your question? All right, very good. Well, from a teacher perspective and a parent perspective, I've had students who were passed on 
and especially since the end of course exams, taking away from teachers not being able to teach the whole curriculum the way it used to be taught, a lot of times kids don't get all the math they need or all of the science they need. So if you pass them on, they're just you might be setting them up for failure. They're not ready, they haven't even learned the basics, and they haven't completed it to be able to build upon it, especially when you're thinking about math. Now reading, I agree with Michael. You know, I feel bad for these kindergarten kids from last year having, you know, from March on off and first graders. Look how much reading they missed. And it, this is so important, and I agree with Michael too, that reading, if they don't learn how to read successfully, that, that's the backbone. Not everybody's going to be able to pass algebra two and pass the end of course exam. But we have to make sure that, like Molly said, take a look and evaluate, well, how weak is the student in reading, or how weak is the student in math? Maybe we can make some accommodations. We used to, and we still do have intensive reading classes, and um, I'm not sure in the middle school if we still have intensive math because I haven't taught middle school for a while. But those programs are good, or those if that part of the curriculum is good because it does give them that extra help. And then maybe simultaneously, if they're taking some other classes that um, would inter intertwine with them, like another math class, that would help them. And a lot of times, the teacher there will tutor them. So um, yeah, I definitely think they need to be able to pass. Um, each skill. As an administrator in Lake County, I met with my teachers by grade level every month. I did not wait for end, the end of the year meetings to see if they were retention meetings. I would meet with them every month. Is this child getting it? Is he not? If they had a child that had dropped a grade level in math, reading, whatever the case may be, they had to come to the table with me. We sit down. What's working? What's not working? Where does he have a problem? Does he have a learning problem? You know, a learning disability that needs looked at. Does he need to be referred for testing? We would give them teachers time to go back within the next month to try different strategies. They would not leave the table unless they had different strategies on how to make this child successful in the classroom. If they came back the next month and it still wasn't working, and we did this a few times in trial and error, then we would look at, he needs to be tested by the psychologist to see if there's a problem there. But it's an ongoing process, and that's what makes those children achieve. You start early with the interventions to assist them so they can be successful. Thank you very much. And Anita is coming back to close our meeting. Oh, Sandy, sorry. <laughs> Two apologies. All right. Uh, I don't think we're doing the student any justice by passing them on. So I, I don't agree with just to pass them on just to do it. Uh, sometimes the reason it's done because of numbers. Well, I'm not in the numbers business as far as that part. Uh, we need to educate our kids. And in our elementary programs, we have intensive reading. We have intensive math. We have different things that are there that are set up. We have teacher assistants that work with students. The thing that I look at is one size doesn't fit all. Not everyone learns the same way as fast as anyone else. I was the type of person, I didn't like someone to read something to me. I wanted to read it for myself because as I'm reading it for myself, I got more out of it than someone reading it. So every student has to be able to progress at their own speed. And that's where some of these different programs that we have through the computer programs and through the teacher programs that are available there, that they're able to monitor to see how the progression of that student is doing. And so that they are able to give more attention to that student to bank them and say, hey, okay, we need to work on this. Now, another great thing that has happened in the years past is volunteers from the community that would be willing to go and volunteer in the schools. Right now, we're not going to be allowing that to start with because of this COVID, but volunteers that would go and work with the students and tutor them, take them outside and read a story to them or let the student read to them. This was a big thing, and it continues to be a big thing that's spread around. At one time, it was called like create a big brother or, or you're a big brother or, or a big sister, whichever you may be, uh, to go and help that student. Also with our math. As I said, it, it's sad when a college athlete graduates and he can't read or write. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank
thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being sharing and being so candid with all of us. And you are excused.